through my presentation. Um, and these are all particularly pertinent, I think, to a lot of the material that we've been discussing um, during the course of this conference. Um, and some of these are very broad, so the idea of how our cultural institutions have evolved. And I'm conscious that uh, co as colleagues, we come from different organizational backgrounds. So I'm going to be speaking more from the specific context of, of the visual arts and, and a visual arts museum. Um, what are some of the new models of exhibition making that have emerged in recent years? And for those who were here um, uh, just pr previously, the talk uh, about the new uh, Panama Canal Zone, this sort of territory of um, the shifting terrain of museum practice, I think is, is particularly pertinent. So I'm gonna go through some of the fundamental shifts in curatorial practice um, and ask how these have sort of been, how are they related to some of the wider transformations? And that is to say that this concept of what I'm calling a dynamic exhibition, this is nothing new. So I'm gonna begin with a bit of a historical uh, background to give uh, everyone uh, some context as to this sort of ongoing evolution of museum practice, really since the 1960s and arguably as far back as the 19th century. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose that question, how it differs from these earlier historical forms of exhibition making and how these changes have impacted museums' roles within the contemporary landscape. So let's get started. I'm, I'm focusing on a series of case studies. Um, these are uh, exhibitions from um, the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands exhibition schedule, primarily um, from the past three or four years. So recently kind of straddling um, uh, the immediate years prior to the pandemic and, and then subsequently since the pandemic, the onset of the pandemic. So talking about that historical arc, how have museums changed? And I apologize uh, for those in the room, uh, some of this will be well known to you, but I think it's pertinent to just trace this very brief history of museum practice. So we start, uh, not exactly at the beginning, but we start in the late 18th, 19th century, and we're looking at institutions that really evolved out of what were royal collections, aristocratic collections, uh, the products um, often of, of dubious and ill-gotten gains that we discussed at the keynote address. So looking at the influence of imperialism and colonial expansion, 19th century ethnographic collections, so things like the British Museum, uh, the Ethnographic Museum at Trocadero in Paris, and this whole phenomenon uh, that also spurred things such as world fairs and this sort of anthropological Western gaze that was also alluded to in the keynote. Uh, but we're going to fast forward a bit and come to the advent of the modern art museum. Um, and what I mean by that is really this concept of the white cube, um, which has been so influential in museum practice. In fact, one of the things we have talked about at the National Gallery is our building, the architecture of our building, which is really very striking, but it's very modern. Um, and so that kind of impacts questions of access and I think how people perceive our institutions. We've gone from these imposing neoclassical facades to these sort of modern uh, white cube edifices. So um, MoMA is perhaps the prime example, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And uh, I've included two images here. Um, one is an illustration that accompanied an exhibition in 1936, uh, Cubism and Abstract Art. And it's kind of the embodiment of this um, model of exhibition making based on canonical histories of Western art. So anyone who's studied art history, uh, this very old fashioned model of a sequence of movements or styles, one coming very conveniently and neatly after the other. Um, and this notion of the white cube is something that uh, Brian O'Doherty, the critic, described in this way. Um, in his 1976 essay, and I provided a quote on the screen there, titled Inside the White Cube, the Ideology of the Gallery Space, the author describes this phenomenon in terms of an ideal gallery that subtracts from the artwork all cues that interfere with the fact that it is art. The work is isolated from everything that would detract from its own evaluation of itself. This gives the space a presence possessed by other spaces where conventions are preserved 
through the repetition of a closed system of values. And I think that last point is important when we're talking about this idea of the dynamic exhibition, this idea of a closed system which sets up almost a, a dichotomy um, between open and closed, hermetic, you might say, and porous. Um, and I want to suggest when we talk about this idea of the dynamic exhibition, that it's really a model of exhibition making that is really antithetical to what you're seeing on the screen here. It's receptive. So it's a very different um, convention of display, if you will. Now, I wanted to talk about um, Caribbean museums um, specifically. Um, so just a, I've, I've called it kind of foundations and evolutions. And obviously, each island, each territory has its own history. But we've been talking over the course of this conference about the genesis of museums uh, and the prehistory, right? The sort of pre-archaeology that's often overlooked and ignored in, in terms of how our institutions evolved, where they came from. So talking about indigenous artifacts and material legacies that predate um, European colonization, uh, colonial architectural heritage, and also um, the various national galleries and historic historical collections, all of which have their own kind of foundation and origin stories. So I've, I've put the uh, National Museum of Fine Arts in Cuba there. Uh, there's also an image of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. So moving more into the present, um, talking about the contemporary landscape, what's changed? So we talked about questions of restitution, came up. Um, some of the most prominent museums in the world now are finally taking a, a long, hard look in the mirror uh, and, and raising these questions uh, about the reappraisal of their collections, um, about colonial histories, uh, restitution, and the museum's role in contemporary society. And they're adopting new presentational formats. And I think that's important when we're talking about museum practice, curatorial practice. So a good example of this would be Tate Modern, uh, which obviously evolved out of the Tate, opened in the year 2000 and was much heralded. And they introduced these themed galleries. So these are um, something that's pretty commonplace now, um, but moving away from a chronological presentation of their collection, that Alfred Barr model that I, I spoke about uh, earlier in the presentation, and introducing non-Western perspectives. So this idea of decentering those canonical histories. Uh, the Museum of Modern Art, which I, I sort of castigated earlier, um, have kind of moved more towards a, uh, I would say, this, this more receptive dynamic model. So um, in 2019, most of you or many will know that MoMA uh, underwent a, a very substantial renovation. Uh, this was following a, a major, major rebuild in 2004. Uh, and one of the main things that they introduced was this idea of ahistorical juxtaposition. So in this image here, you'll see Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, but you'll also see uh, alongside it uh, a work by Faith Ringgold um, from the 1960s. So this is part of this non-Western, uh, the introduction of a, a kind of non-Western perspective into um, the, the sort of shrine of our, our sort of major museums and arts institutions. And also, moving away from conventional exhibitions, biennials have obviously proliferated since the 1990s. And here in the Caribbean, um, you know, one of the most important biennials, certainly in this part of the world, is the Havana Biennial. And that was founded in 1984. Also, Sao Paulo Biennial in Brazil. Uh, and this is an image from 2019. Uh, Havana is notable for um, having this wonderful array of um, installations sort of installed in situ. Um, this one was from the 13th Biennial uh, down near the Malacan um, installation by the artist Okuda San Miguel. Um, what's also been, I think, really promising to see is this sort of widening of the institu institutional validation of Caribbean art. Um, so I picked up a couple examples here. Um, the Perez Art Museum is obviously um, largely responsible, in, in large part has done um, really great work 
in giving Caribbean artists the sort of visibility that they deserve. Um, this is an installation shot from uh, a major exhibition of contemporary Caribbean art that happened right before the pandemic, actually called The Other Side of Now, and uh, currently actually at the uh, MCA in Chicago. Um, there's a, another big survey of contemporary art looking more at Caribbean art from the 1990s. So, so these are real breakthroughs from where perhaps Caribbean art was seen um, even 10, 20 years ago. So I'm gonna to come to this idea a little bit more, kind of pass out this idea of the dynamic exhibition. Um, so there's a couple of images up on the screen, um, one of which is of uh, the Brooklyn Museum in the top right-hand corner. This was an initiative they introduced called Target First Saturdays. Uh, it was hugely successful in opening up the museum, particularly to the local community, which in that part of Brooklyn uh, includes Crown Heights, which is a major Caribbean community and also the site of uh, New York Carnival. Um, so as I said, this is an ongoing change. It's not something that's come out of nowhere. Uh, it's really symptomatic of a broader phenomenon of democratizing museum space that's been ongoing since the 1990s. And it also comes out of a more politically progressive approach, this idea of reforming these entrenched hierarchical structures. And it's most importantly, it's audience focused and community centric. So hence the images I've chosen are less of the exhibitions themselves and some of this programming um, that is now a key part of exhibition making in our contemporary era. So I wanna talk a little bit about the National Gallery and a couple of case studies. I've chosen three exhibitions here just to use as illustrations of some of the points I've made. Um, this first one is uh, the recent rehang that was done by our curatorial team of the National Collection in our upper exhibition hall. And it's an exhibition called The Ties That Bind. So this is a presentation of the collection um, and it's been done in a a, a sort of thematic presentation. So the idea, I think, big picture with these sorts of exhibitions is moving away from this real art historical focus on art and artists seen in a vacuum and looking at what I've written here as a, an inclusive conception of cultural production. So one that's multicultural, but also multi-generational. Um, it's about storytelling. So, in terms of this metaphor, if you like, of stories, you know, all exhibitions tell a story. Um, critic and curator uh, Bruce Ferguson wrote in a 1996 essay called Exhibition Rhetoric. Um, he wrote this about defining what an exhibition is. He says, an exhibition is um, defined as the central speaking subject in the stories about art which institutions and curators tell to themselves and to us. So it's really about storytelling. Um, what we've tried to achieve is this idea of exhibitions as a vehicle uh, for the exploration of historical narratives, one that's participatory and community driven. So I'm gonna just talk about some of these community initiatives. So this idea of moving away from the singular curatorial voice, this is an exhibition on the screen, some installation shots from an exhibition we did in 2020 called Island of Women. And this was a group curated show that came out of a workshop with uh, Jamaican art historian and curator Verla Pupai. Uh, the idea for the show was conceived in, in that context and then was um, collaboratively conceived and executed at the National Gallery. So it's this idea again, that I've touched on the decentering the privileged position of the curator as a gatekeeper, as, as the so-called expert and moving away from that idea of this singular authorial voice. So about pluralistic knowledge, um, knowledge gathering, knowledge sharing and presentation. Um, the biennial, um, obviously the past couple of years have been really marked by the biennial and its influence. Um, this was our second Cayman Islands Biennial, Reimagined Futures, uh, and it was really responsive in the sense that the theme of this exhibition was almost prescribed from the beginning. You couldn't have an exhibition in 2020 or 2021 that didn't address these things. So, uh, you know, the influence of Black Lives Matter protests in the States in the summer of 2020, and of course the pandemic. Um, so this idea of being receptive to societal shifts and changing norms, I think this is critical. It's what museums are doing, um, and it's really pushing 
the conversation forward in terms of audience engagement. So I'm just going to sum up here, talking about this idea of the expansive museum, a gallery without walls. So there are various ways we can achieve that. Um, some of the obvious ones are off-site exhibitions. This image is actually a, an artwork by a commanding artist called John Reno Jackson. It's an installation that was one part of this wider biennial project. And you'll see from the surrounding foliage, it's installed actually at our Queen Elizabeth Botanic Park. So off-site exhibitions, multi-site and uh, multi-district programming. So, you know, being here in the Bahamas, I think this is something that the um, National Gallery has done a great job with, recognizing that the Bahamas is not just Providence and Nassau, it's a community of 30 inhabited islands and over 700 islands. So this idea of taking art out to where people live, very important. Um, a gallery without walls, also less literally, we're talking about this digital space. Uh, which is really critical. How do we reach audiences beyond our islands? Well, the most obvious way is through digital programming. So this is something museums are implementing uh, all around the world or have already done so. And for us, it was really important at the National Gallery to continue this work. So um, you'll see on the screen just some screenshots. This is our online collection page on the left and on the right, a virtual tour, because we really found that during the pandemic, of course, people missed that connection that in-person connection. But a virtual tour is a way of, of sharing exhibitions that can be really effective in its own, in its own light. Um, and so to conclude, talking about future directions, I've picked out some language here that I think is um, evocative, is meant to make us consider our role and what we do and who we serve. So I've got some final points here about the future directions that we might want to look to and keep in mind as we move forward. Um, the idea of a museum, we've talked about the ICOM definition. Well, if we're transforming our institutions, perhaps we need to give ourselves new names as well. So this idea of a civic space is, is very productive, I think. Talking about everything the museum does, not just its exhibitions, so wellness programs, outreach, events, education and programming. Um, making sure that we're, we stay responsive and socially engaged. So it's about giving voice um, and amplifying voices from the community. And it's also about providing a, a platform, a platform, a space for people to uh, share and be heard. Um, the last couple of points I wanted to make on this, this very pertinent point of the transformation of museums. Um, the deprivileging of the exhibition. So this image, to conclude with, I haven't chosen an image of an exhibition, but I've chosen an image from our West Bay Heritage Day. This was just this year. Um, talking about going out into the community, bringing art to people where they live, where they can access it. And I think this is something that's just starting. It's an ongoing process of critical self-reflection. And that means being authentic and asking ourselves tough questions about the work that we're doing. And it's something that's predicated on an inclusive and equitable model of cultural production and display. So it's really about redressing historical imbalances. So I wanna say thank you and that whirlwind uh, presentation, but uh, time for questions if anyone would like to ask a question. the white cube to now the picnic table, right? Um, but it's always a question of resources. And I'm not asking to, to say I'm looking for an answer as much as, you know, how do we find creative resources in our communities, our small communities, where there's really finite funding for exhibitions, there's finite funding for museum spaces. We're still breaking down community intelligence and barriers around elitism attached to where money comes from for our museums. And I just, I'm, I'm sitting here with a, a hat on as a board director with a foundation where we're trying to get our community to do more in terms of collaboration. You know, having, for example, museum working with uh, a mental health, a mental wellness uh, service provider and to evolve a program that will have some kind of interesting reach. And um, I guess I'm kind of posting a question and answering at the same time. But it's sort of like, how do we, how, how do we engage collaborators with our museums um, who might already have their own perceptions of us 
and what we think they need to do and how we do it. And how do we how do we get all of that great work for your vision boarding into reality without ourselves finding ourselves shackled by the perception we don't have the money, you know? Because it's always about cash that stops great ideas often getting off the table. Um, Why? Well, I think open up. Maybe other people have thoughts too. I think I would start with the word collaboration. Um, I think it was very instructive for me. We've done some tours while we've been here in the Bahamas, and we went to Bahama Resort which is not usually somewhere I would frequent, I think. Um, but, you know, you go in with that cynicism or, or sort of slight uh, skepticism about, you know, the conjunction or the marriage of tourism and commerce and the visual arts, you know, we see them as kind of uh, antithetical or opposed to one another. But I think there can be productive partnerships where if we're willing to put art in spaces where perhaps previously it wouldn't have been deemed appropriate. Um, you, you reach new audiences. And in fact, when we were walking around, we went and visited The Current um, and Echo as well, another contemporary space within Bahama. Um, one of the things that I was struck by was, you know, if you take away your assumptions and, and you actually observe um, people were looking at this work on the walls. They weren't just passing it by on their way to the casino or a restaurant or a, a conference center uh, uh, talk that they were involved in. Um, and so I think that's part of it. It's collaboration. It's moving art into spaces where people from different walks of life meet, you know, because one of these things that we've talked about uh, across our profession is about um, barriers, but also invisible barriers. Barriers that perhaps on the inside we cannot see because we're on the inside. So I talked about architecture and the kind of symbolism of architecture, which is someone, uh, you know, critics, people such as Carol Duncan in her book on museums, civilizing rituals, have sort of uh, broken down a little bit. The, the sort of symbolic uh, gatekeeping that happens just in through the, the architecture, the, the kind of conventions of museum architecture. Even somewhere like the Villa Doyle, I think National Gallery of the Bahamas, you know, has this, uh, these colonial associations, and some people respond to that, you know, negatively, and, and with good reason in some instances. So I, I think that's just a few responses I would give. Yes, um, I couldn't agree more with you. I mean, collaboration is probably one of the key words in here. And, um, um, but also I see before going, you know, before engaging in collaboration, probably I see two steps before that we have to do a little bit of our own homework. And the first step is we have to revisit ourselves. We have to see ourselves from a different point of view. If we're going to engage with non-traditional partners, the first thing we need to do is we have to look into ourselves and see what else we can offer. Because when we are stepping into non-traditional partners, we have a, a well-known uh, value and contribution to the community. However, when we're going further, then we have to we have to look up to ourselves again and see this is these are the strong points that are gonna communicate to this partner. What are the benefits for them that are non-traditional part of our museum to work with us? How can we contribute to make them work, their vision, whatever and, and goals better? So that will be the first step. Trying to revisit ourselves and see if the message that we're that we traditionally has been put it out for traditional partners is going to work in a different environment, right? And the second step is we need to understand also the changing external environment. Um, what I call that I'm going to um, speak a little bit more tomorrow about what I call the forces of changes. There are so many um, drivers of change around us, especially in the last few years, from social, economic, technological, the pandemic, everything is changing day by day around us. And museums, like many organizations, we are not responding at the same page. So we have to understand 
the external environment a little bit better and see which of those drivers of change are more are impacting us greater. And then based on that, then we can move forward. But again, it's probably looking internally and then looking external, right? Before we engage in collaboration. Then we can probably have a more engaging and productive result if we know exactly what we can offer and if we know exactly what we can expect. Um, oh, well, we, we should wrap up, but I have an yeah, actual question for you. Um, so my question is really about the last kind of conceptualization around um, pushing against the board, the boundaries, and kind of going into the undefined space. Um, so how how is how are the audience how is the audience reacting to the change right because I think there's a way in which um, we we I think as professionals we see the kind of borderlessness as being an important transformational moment in our engagement with our work but we we actually do have multiple stakeholders and there is a large stakeholder body that likes the idea of a museum in a building, mm -hmm. right? So, um, one of, so my question is, how have, you know, the interventions and, and came, um, at the gallery, how have they been received? And, um, and what would you say, if there hasn't been a pushback, um, so much as what would be your rethinking, like, what are the possible negatives, right? Because we know it's, it's where we're all thinking of going, and we, it's where we all believe um, is the most effective way to engage Caribbean stakeholders. But it, uh, you know, very few of us have actually said, "Well, there are some things that we need to think about." That, and um, you know, and mm -hmm. so, do you think there are things that we need to think about? That we should just run straight down the road, or are there stakeholders who are like, "Hold up, I'm not comfortable with this." Well, I I think it's. You know, it, first in terms of context, you know, the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands was founded in 1997. So we're a relatively young organization. And the art scene in Cayman is equally relatively young. We're talking about 50, 60 years in terms of a professional fine art practice. So um, it's still a new field, you know, an emerging field. And I think um, communities want to go into spaces that reflect them. Um, they want to understand and be part of um, an institution, not feel like an outsider when they come into it. So I think one of the ways you address that is we talked about access. You know, we have free admission at the National Gallery, which I think is very important. Um, people often overlook that. Um, access on a literal level, you know, uh, uh, the Bahamas, you know, with their inter-island traveling exhibition program, I mean, that's really critical because you're, you're trying to span this huge geographic space, right? Communities that are physically detached. Now, Cayman is a, 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 a trio of islands, you know, um, but very, very centralized. So, you know, we have a population of about 80,000 now, officially. Um, 78 of those 80,000 people live on Grand Cayman. And between 50 and 60% of that number live on the Western Peninsula, that's Georgetown, Seven Mile Beach. So the outer districts, while they're connected to the island, can often feel quite removed. And so from what we've seen, audiences are very receptive to, when you come out to their community, put art in their neighborhoods and communities where they can actually come and see it. Uh, what we've done, uh, Recently, it's, it's a continuation of a program that was called Art on the Road. Uh, you think about the collection, we talked about kind of conservation issues in the previous presentation. Um, obviously, there are barriers to bringing, you know, oil paintings out in 80% uh, relative humidity and what have you. And so uh, we've actually produced reproductions, um, very high quality reproductions uh, that we can travel. So actually bringing the collection, not just um, rotating temporary exhibitions. And then, you know, piggybacking on, we talked about collaboration, where there are um, district days or where there are festivals where people are gathering for other forms of 
um, well, for fun, right? For cultural activity, for eating, for uh, sharing food, um, making sure we're part of those events as well. Um, and that's something I think that goes back to the example I gave of the Brooklyn Museum where um, that initiative they did, having late night opening hours, having DJs, you know, they had, you know, soca and dance hall nights and things, and people started coming to the museum. And what they saw is they'd redeveloped the front facade of the Brooklyn Museum, they built an amphitheater. Uh, they're kind of like bowl seating, you know, and kids started to come up and just sit on these seats and hang out and they would skateboard and then chat, or they're on their cell phones, right? But slowly, bit by bit, they started to sort of poke their head in the doors and say, what is this place? You know, these were, in many cases, families who had lived in the neighborhood for years and realized, oh, I'm allowed in here, I can go in here. Yeah, come on in. And people would start going in. And so I think building those bridges is, is really what we're talking about, however you can achieve that, so. Shani, if I can add to that too, um, I think for us, um, as a team at NDC, and there's a lot of us in the room today, it's not having a finite difference between the curatorial department and the education outreach department. So when we're conceptualizing this project, whether it be the exhibition sitting inside the walls, mm -hmm. or we have satellite venues in both of the outer islands that we'll mention as well, and we're now going out um, to do pop-up exhibitions in the districts too, it's ensuring that that whole team is activated around it and contributing mm -hmm. to what it's going to look like, because we're going to have much more success than me. Everyone is contributing to stuff. So that's really how we're setting up several of the models that one has shared is that bring those heads together straight away and having the programming be as an inherent part of the project as the physical exhibition is. It's too, and I've been running a lot of success in that. Okay, so any other questions as we wrap up? Yes, sir. My comment is just to. Uh, to say thank you first, William, for the wonderful presentation and uh, also the path that the National Gallery has taken. Uh, take what I like to call taking the museum to the people is a great idea, and that's the direction that museums should start thinking about. Most times we we'll see as museums and say people are not coming to our museum. Why are they not coming? But we don't. We rarely sit and say, "Why do we take the museum to the people?" Mm. And, uh, and uh, that's part of decolonizing our exactly. minds, actually, uh, that we should be thinking about as uh, <coughs> museum uh, professionals. And when it comes to partnering to non-traditional partners that uh, don't understand uh, much of what we do, we worry. What is it that we're taking to the table? One of the things that is different that we do as museum professionals in the, the, and as museums is that in the museum is the only place different from a school environment where a person comes in, he chooses what to learn, how long it will learn, and he, will, he or she will learn, and what they will learn, and it gives a very different experience than what you can get anywhere else. And that's a value that we have that is not, it's rare that you rarely find it. And also, we do have the trust of the community. I like to always say museums are considered as ethical lighthouses for the community. They trust the things we bring out to the communities. And therefore, this is an inherent value that we have and what we bring to the table. And at times, we seem to forget that we, we have this as, as museum professionals. And this is what we, 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 we do bring to the table. And, uh, and here I'm thinking, for instance, if you were to partner with a hospital to say, and you want to talk about uh, heart disease and stuff like that. You know, if the hospital wants to talk about these non-communicable diseases and they make an open day, you know, the people that are timid of mm. just the hospital environment, they will not go there, even if it is there. But if it is brought to a museum and you make your programs and people feel relaxed and they, they, they're in an environment that they can 
uh, go there and, and learn more about uh, these issues. It's different. Right. The, none, there are no institutions, very few institutions I know have that, that value in us, and uh, this is one thing that we must cherish yeah. as museum professionals and always remember, which is uh, very important and of shining. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to stop. <laughs> Thank you.